Yippee. And uh, and away we go. Clickety clack, clickety clack. Light bulb. Typewriters. Remember typewriters. Remember mechanics. Remember dial telephones. Remember telephones. How long ago it is in a galaxy far, far away. Here we are. Ice. And uh, my evolution hour. One of these days, I'll have to have an actual evolution hour. We'll work on that. Uh, there's my WordPress uh, uh, .com website. If you don't know about that, why not? Here, not that it's doing me any good. Okay, uh, so we are on another evolution hour. Uh, we have a a, a beer dr or wine drinking uh, porcine organism with us as a uh, a guest commentator. <laughs> you got a new logo there. Introduce yourself. <laughs> Hello, for those who don't know me by my voice now, I am Frustrated Atheist, and, well, I do shit on YouTube. Sometimes. <laughs> and you got a different logo, which I didn't recognize. Uh, yes, the uh, logo was, uh, was done by the phenomenal artist known as Trey Baldwin, or on Twitter he's known as at uh, Art of TC Baldwin. You should definitely, if you mm. ever decide to get a avatar and that this goes for you rj or anyone at all if you are trying to go with an a avatar that has been uh drawn definitely check him out he is phenomenal yeah yeah and, and um i i love that kind of uh, visual element i'm still at the clunky level of almost no software um, and making sure that i have all my computers shut down to the point where i'm not roboting so this is remarkably uh, primitive um, thing, but what can hell I do? Anyway, uh, as um, uh, you may know, if not, you've been living in a cave or not paying attention to my previous videos. Uh, what I've been doing for the last many, many weeks is a demolition and analysis from the source methods level of Contested Bones, the creationist book by uh, Rupi and Sanford, John Sanford, the genetic entropy guy, in case you're not familiar with him, uh, who has actually got genetics creds, although his brain seems to atrophy once he became a young earth creationist, and I, I need to investigate that more. But anyway, in this particular case, a uh, creator of dreams says, hello, Mr. RJ. Well, hello, creator of dreams. Um, the um, uh, Rupi was actually the one that did most of the research on it, and for this he should not be terribly proud, uh, because he is a, um, a very um, annoying quote miner and secondary source addict. And uh, I, uh, as I've been going through section by section, because there's no bibliography, there's no index in the book, which is bad dog from a source methods point of view. I mean, it's making it hard to find information. Uh, so I'm compiling a bibliography and I'm doing a spreadsheet that analyzes how many of things fall into each category and all of that. And they're roughly running maybe 40% technical citations out of it. They're only running about two sources per page, which is pretty low uh, in general. And of those, only about 40% are um, technical ones. And of those, none of them are actually supporting their arguments. Uh, but some of the stuff, oh, almost 40% so far, um, are uh, things that they're quote mining and scavenging for information that's actually misrepresenting the papers. And this uh, um, uh, Sussman paper uh, that uh, pops up from 1983, which is a long time ago, um, is um, one that was available open access so everybody can read it to find out what's actually in there. They were, they've been quote mining it several times where they'll just tactically cite a little teeny blurb like they'll, um, uh, the, the, the particular one that um, struck me this time, uh, where they have a dot, dot, dot. Among monkeys and apes, the greatest degrees of uh, valgus carrying angle is found in Alites and Pongo. As uh, measured by Halasek 1972, the values for bicondular angle in 14 specimens of orangutan and seven specimens of spider monkey overlap the range of his sample of 21 humans. That's very technical stuff, and it's about the particular way a bone runs in primates and others. The problem is he's not citing the rest of the material. And the same thing, even a longer quote when they make a conclusion, it's all for their argument that Australopithecines weren't bipedal, that they were just apey and chimpanzee-ish. The problem is, is that Stern and Sussman explicitly call it a one Australopithecines a wonderful transitional intermediate. And they point out that it's it's bipedal, but yet it's still got arboreal characteristics. And they go through and they discuss all the reasons why they're they're the ancestral group for human beings and all the rest. And that's way back in 1983. Um, so the article is actually quite useful. 
and uh, really nobody's arguing the point that that um, uh, Sussman uh, and others are that, that everybody has argued that the Australopithecines were really good climbers and they weren't fully bipedal in the completely arched foot way with the ball underneath our big toe element that's very characteristic of humans. And this information gets pointed out in these technical papers. Uh, another one where they, where they go even farther off the map on the same page, on page 109 of their book, where um, they say, um, uh, paleo experts have said that Australopith hips do not appear intermediate between ape and man. They are unique. Anatomist Owen Lovejoy, who was responsible for reconstructing Lucy's pelvis, affirms this in the journal Gait and Posture. Quote, the hip of Australopithecus is thus not intermediate between apes and humans, but is instead a unique mosaic. Unquote. Oh, I want you to read that whole quote. And it's in fact on page 106 of Owen's uh, uh, Lovejoy's paper, because he explains what he means by mosaic. He says that it's not an intermediate in that it's not something that's on the way to handling a great big brain the way ours does, because Australopithecines didn't have great big brains. They had small ape-sized brains. So they didn't have to worry about that. That's the thing that is the mosaic part, that it is a bipedal animal that's not as fully bipedal as we are, and yet, it also is not carrying this feature of adaptation for really big brains, which don't start showing up until really big brains do, like with Homo erectus. And so to leave all of that part out, which Owen Lovejoy is writing in 2005, so there's a lot more dust has settled by that time. That's 20 years uh, after the old Sussman article. Uh, this is just blatant quote mining and data selection. So to have all of those papers up, by all means, read the old 1983 article to give you some of that point of view back in the 1980s, and then the 2005 article to bring you up to speed on that. Oh, by the way, um, uh, our Porcine fellow, do keep an eye on what's going on in the live chat uh, if you have that okay. available, uh, just in case anybody puts up like questions or something that I managed to, to miss, or somebody says hi and all that, we can um, uh, call attention to them, because that is the audience, and they're the ones that are paying attention to stuff. Uh, so. Uh, I, I the, the issue that I've been bringing up repeatedly, like a boring drumbeat, is the idea that source methods matter. That what I'm doing here in this follow the footnote thing isn't some trivial detail. It's how you open up the, the hood of the person's brain, and it works just as well for me or anybody else uh, on this uh, front. That if you read any of my works, and start looking up my footnotes and seeing how I use source material and when I'm quoting stuff, why I'm quoting it and am I leaving anything out, uh, I should be able to pass muster at that. But when you find people that the moment you check out the original material, you can see them doing the little three card Monty shuffleboard with the source material. And it happens not once in a while, but relentlessly, that's a pattern. And it's not a good one. It's unacceptable scholarship. And therefore, it doesn't matter even whether their sources are accurate or inaccurate. They're not playing the source methods game. And that rules them out boop, right off the bat. Um, it, there's, you cannot arrive at correct conclusions if you're not playing fair with your data field, even if you have correct data. Oh, Jackson Weed in there. I, I thought I put a, a blurb in for Jackson uh, in, in his thing. I hope he got in there if he wants to join us. Uh, he may jolly well do so. Jackson uh, and I, in case you do not know, are writing a new book together where, uh, inspired by my um, efforts with uh, Evolution Slam Dunk, and for those of you who don't have Evolution Slam Dunk on the Reptile Mammal Transition, why not? It's... It's an important book. I wrote it to be an important book because it covered an area nobody had covered. And um, so that means it fills a niche in the field. And plus, the writer needs the royalties, damn it. <laughs> I, need, I need the revenue. Anyway, Jackson and I are doing um, a full court press analysis of the Answers book series. Um, we've got several different answers books under the belt, and we're going to be going through their various claims from radiometric dating and flood geology and complaints about evolution, blah, blah, blah. And um, it will be up to date and meticulously documented, and we will be showing the head up the assism that occurs at Answers in Genesis more specifically, as well as bringing up a relative subject. Because the I didn't deal a lot with the radiometric dating 
and chronology issues in Slam Dunk because um, it didn't per se come up in their arguments. They were they were falling apart on the reptile mammal transition at the systematic level, in, independent of chronology. But chronology and radiometric dating and these other matters uh, are just right in the thick of it when we're dealing with uh, young earth creationism, full blown you know, flood geology and all the rest. So it'll be a, it'll be a fun, well, the tentative title is the rocks are still there, which is that, you know, you can quibble all sorts of stuff, but the evidence is still there to look at. You got to account for it. And uh, so this will be a, a really, um, uh, I think a good fill in the blank thing. All of my tip work, once I got myself up to speed, for those of you who don't know exactly what I'm up to, I'm not just an old fart traipsing around on the YouTube um, pontificating, even though I do that. Um, what I'm doing in the background research that doesn't appear is I'm pinning something down literally nobody had ever done before, which uh, in part because it would have been really difficult. I had built up a data field that made it possible. Hello, Jackson, you will be out talking with you in just a moment. Um, yes, uh, the, Nappy, uh RJ Neppy had said that uh, they never really understood why AIG tried to come up with the idea that the first create created in quotes animals had complete in quotes genomes uh, or all the genes their descendants could diverge from. Ooh, that's a good question. And I fortunately know the answer to it because they were forced into it. Um, it was relatively easy to imagine generically created kinds. So you, it, you'd say, well, look at that dog and look at that cat. Those are separate kinds. And then maybe they might say dinosaurs, but they didn't really deal, well, they had to deal with dinosaurs, didn't they? My, the kids are going to the library and reading about dinosaurs and they're reading all sorts of terrible things like that they lived millions of years ago and they ate meat, some of them. And oh, uh, uh, uh. Uh, so uh, this, they were forced onto this, but where it kicks into high gear, and it's not just answers in Genesis. Michael Behe was trying to kind of feel that, um, the, the sort of ur bacterium where all of the basic genetic systems were present and then just merely filtered. That's how you could theoretically accept common descent as if everything that now makes up all the stuff now was buried in the ur gene a long time ago. But now, boy, uh, Ken Miller pointed out, nope, that don't work. Uh, when you look at the details, oh, there's way too much that's developed over very, very long periods of time and natural mutations and recombinations and the things. No, there, none, there's none of that. But creationists are forced into things because they have got two bottlenecks during the flood. One is the initial creation event and the fact that every animal that supposedly is preserved, that is preserved because it died in the flood, it means all of that diversity had to ex exist at the time of the flood. But if you figure out how many animals, if each one of those is a created kind, then all of those created kinds had to be on board the ark for, to be preserved later on as the ones that are now seen in today's animals, all of which have descended from the animals on the ark. And those two sets aren't really the same. You have got, uh, so you have to end up with a, and plus the booking stall plan, there's only a limited amount of space on the ark. Maybe 1500 spots are kind of okay with a couple uh, of a pair for the unclean animals and seven pairs for the clean ones, uh, which is the prescription of the Bible. Whatever it is, you got to whittle it down a lot. And so you have bottleneck one, which is all of the fossil representations that we see dying in 2350 BC, thereabouts, in the flood, had to have originated by natural within Barrowman mutations uh, in only 1700 years since creation in 4000 BC. And then those same original kinds have to proliferate in about the same amount of 1700 years which is bringing us down into more historic times when people are bumping into the animals because they're capturing them and putting them in arenas and they're seeing the birds and all that. So all of that functionally has to have originated in, in another 1700 year bottleneck. And so the easiest way around this is the idea that somehow or other all that genetic variation was designed in place and all we're sealing is, is just fiddly bidding. And that's an argument that's been popping up more and more frequently in the last 10 years or so. So does, if that, does that answer that question adequately? 
cricket silence. <laughs> mm. <laughs> well, by the um, way, hi, Jackson. So. Yeah, hello? say hello, Jackson. <laughs> my, you probably did send me the link, but my uh, Twitter has been acting strange today. I oh, yeah, I did. I, I, I gave that because, uh, yeah. I lost all so my anyway, uh, oh, uh, gonna go for it. Asks um, uh, any word on unicorn fossils yet, or four-headed beasts? They're in the Bible, supposedly drowned in the flood. Oh, unicorns actually. Answers in Genesis says, and ICR in particular have gone out of their way to say, oh, there were unicorns. They have found an example of a single horn, like ox, that has been found in the fossil record. That this is like the unicorn. They're, I'm not making this up. This is their argument. Never mind that this thing lived up in Siberia. There was nowhere near anywhere any Bible person could ever have possibly seen it. And that it isn't really what looks like a unicorn in the sense of the unicorn everyone means, which is a horse with a horn. And so uh, it's, it's more grasping at straws in the same way that they scavenge around for dinosaurs as, Le as uh, uh, Behemoth and uh, something or other uh, as um, a Leviathan. <laughs> Anyway, um, so uh, um, I'll, I'll kudos there to Jackson for talking me into doing this uh, new uh, Rocks book because um, as I've been looking through it, it'll be a big thing for us to bite off doing and he's doing most of the heavy lifting. He's uh, writing most of the chapters and then I'm restructuring them and adding my own material and, and taking care of the geek in of making sure that the reference bibliography is, is consistent and that we've not, we've covered all the bases in terms of documentation and uh, make sure that there's a master index and all that other kind of stuff. Uh, but um, um, it will, when we'll get it out, I have no clue. Uh, it'll be done when it's done, but it will be a complete comprehensive dismantling of answers in Genesis answers books. And there's going to be a lot of blood in the sand. There's going to be Bodie Hodge and Georgia Purdom and Monty White and Ken Ham and uh, Jason Lyle and uh, Bartman. And, oh, there's a long list of people <laughs> that we're going to be <laughs> raking over the coals in one way or another on that. Um, oh, we're going to go for it. it. Says, didn't you know God is omniscient? Uh, he could have told them all about it. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, he could have told them about an awful lot of things. I would have been more impressed with the God of Abraham if he had said, don't own people. Just, just, just don't do that. Don't, don't own people. You know, uh, RJ, it, I actually, I wrote two, I wrote two hours today just to deconstruct a one paragraph. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you can get into that. And, and part of the thing that I've discovered in my own work and you've already found out about it and anybody that does really serious source methods analysis is sometimes you're reading through a bunch of dreck. And then after a while, your brain goes, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What did he just say there? It didn't have any references. It made an overt, bold claim. But if you think about it, he has just blown his foot off on this one because he brings up, they bring up subjects that they haven't really thought through. It didn't occur to them to think it through. And so by our thinking it through, we fill in their thinking cap and we also demonstrate why they couldn't do it especially if the information is readily accessible online. I take the motto that if I can find it, anybody can. So if the, the professional creationists cannot find this information, what the hell was stopping them? Sheesh. Honesty. <laughs> uh, well, lack I'm of sorry, curiosity. Laziness. <laughs> lack, lack, lack is really it. The thing that, that pops out relentlessly, and this is true top to bottom, uh, in the anti-evolution brigade, and it's shown most brilliantly by brilliant anti-evolutionists. If you look at John uh, uh, Philip Johnson, this guy ain't dumb. He got into Harvard when he was 16 years old. Dwayne Gish, frankly, was a very meticulous, th 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 as detail fiddlers go, he is relentlessly clever in ferreting out just the little snippet of information that's going to fit his argument and figuring out how to ignore all of the rest. Oh. That's a tactical brilliance. Well. That's that's probably true in a lot of cases. Currently, I'm reading Bodie Hodge's work, and he he's just dumb. He, he just categorically does not understand any of the material he's talking about. Yeah. Yeah, and the the fun part is, uh, and anybody who's gone after Kent Hovind knows exactly the same situation. That it takes way more work to explain and document why they have their head up their ass than it did for them to 
make muffled noises from while their head is up their ass. And uh, uh, it, but you learn a hell of a lot that way. Um, it, Jackson's read Slam Dunk, so he knows about how I took apart uh, Michael Denton on Ants, where there was this just one paragraph of, um, of like authority quoting uh, technical jargon without ever explaining anything about it. And, in, and for me to understand what the hell he was bringing up, I learned a lot about ants and discovered how far away from the data field he was when he decided to quote that stuff. <laughs> In so this it, it, case, it was inversion mutations. Yeah, yeah. What is Hodge's background? Doesn't he have like a master's in something or other? He's a mecha he, yes, he's a mechanical engineer, master's. Which naturally makes him knowledgeable on genetics. <laughs> but he, he's doing this little shtick where he basically, he's talking about all the different types of mutations there are, and he's like, Oh, there are point mutations, and oh, by the way, a point mutation causes cancer. Oh, here's another. <laughs> here's the inversion mutation. This one causes uh, hemo. Uh, what is it? Uh, hemo. Uh, the the blood disease that the royal family had. Yeah, um, yeah. Oh, hemophilia. Hemophilia. Yeah, it's like, and so he just goes through each type. And he's like, here's a disease associated with it. And so I'm like, actually, here's also a beneficial mutation associated with yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. If in many ways, it's the flip side of the, the intelligent design approach to this, because they don't really like to think about unpleasant mutations. See, the, the, the Bible believer, the, the young earth creationist, has the, the sin debt. So all of those nasty little mutations are like the floodgates got opened up after sin, and so the perfect genome that Adam had is now been deteriorating to the point where they can't do incest the way they did to start out with. I'm not making this argument up. Uh, this is the approach that they take. And uh, but the design advocates are in, in a different thing. They don't really like the idea that anything about the design could be creepy. So they don't really want to address the idea that natural mutations, if they're if they're not natural mutations and they're designed, then they must be designed to do whatever they do. And if the thing happens to be a disease, then isn't it designed to do the disease? So that's one of the reasons why I love bringing up ALU uh, and hey, everybody yes. out there. Jackson. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Peter say, uh, says, what's up with Jackson Weed's audio? Did he fall into the pit of hell? Yeah, so, yeah. He's He's got a bad connection in there. Either that or he's inside of a closet. <laughs> it can happen. Uh, I'm amazed. Uh, I never like bother about the car at the moment. Yeah, I, I don't mind too much on that because think of what we're doing here. I am in Spokane, Washington. Jackson is somewhere in humid Southland. You are wherever you are, uh, and so here we, uh, where? Texas. Texas, so here we are in completely different places of the world and are able to instantaneously communicate and talk about stupid shit uh, in a way that would have been absolutely miraculous when I was a kid. So <laughs> I'm not worried about sound quality. <laughs> oh, uh, nearing about nearing half hour. So let me put my shameless plug up. Not that it'll do any good. And uh, then we'll be able to get on to part two, which will be about flood geology and mega sequences, which came about as an interesting little uh, that I uh, only stumbled onto because of um, somebody I think Jackson may know about or uh, uh, others, uh, Isaiah Booker, who is this little young earth creationist who is uh, knocking about in things. Uh, there's my uh, shameless plug sheet. Uh, the patrons who I make, you, you shelled out money, even if none of it's got to me yet. Uh, Stephen, Marigale, Dyer, and Andrew, and Heat, and Yui, and Mona, and Hendrel, and Jen, and Jody, and Daniel, and Ralph, and Eric, and Benjamin, and Staggles, and Alex, and Cirrus, and Totus Real, and Everett, and Paul. Thank you all. My website, uh, which won't do a damn bit of good if you don't use the material there. Uh, and um, uh, eventually, I'd love to reach the stage where I have the wherewithal to be able to do better things, which would have video links, and we could do a whole bunch of other stuff, and I'd be able to update it more, and I'd love to have people trained to follow in my footsteps, so when I'm dead, none of that information will go away, and the process will continue, and there will always be a tip, get it, but not at that stage yet, so anyway, to keep me from dropping dead in the meantime, uh, GoFundMe.com DCGo is there, anybody can help, and that gets money way faster to me than slow as molasses Patreon, so um, uh, there is my shameless plug for uh, uh, to keep the RJ alive, or have everyone on earth buy my books, 
um, if if uh, a, a, every person who thinks that creationism is a pile of dingoes kidneys adds uh, mm -hmm. evolution slam dunk to their uh, bookshelf, uh, they will be better for it, I promise. And um, you're going to have a help to the stupid RJ here because I get a little chunk of that money. And eventually reach the stage, hey, we're maybe regular publisher. If anybody out there knows normal agents and publishers and the like, I've tried to knock on the door, bing, bing, bing of um, various ones, Prometheus Books and others, but I haven't heard back from any of them, probably because I'm a lowly nothing. So um, uh, try to get their attention, and because I'd like to do an illustrated second edition of Slam Dunk, and I, I've got tons of new material that I would update it with, and I know what illustrations it needs, it just needs to get the permissions for it, and to do it up as a book book, that would be properly structured, and that means there would be the publicity tours and all the other things and normal libraries would be prone to buy it my, and maybe even National Center for Science Education might bloody well review it, which they tend to only do for real live books, not the kind of self-published thing that I had to do with uh, Slam Dunk. So there's the catch-22 quandary I'm in. Anyway, um, second half of the show, I think, didn't Jackson or Peter or somebody just have a recent in interaction or comments on Isaiah Booker? Didn't you, Jackson? Yeah, Peter and I talked to him uh, yesterday morning. Yeah, I that missed was... that, so and I couldn't get a link to find out, so I haven't been able to see him. Uh, briefly oh, summarize okay. who this little fellow is and what your interactions were with him. Um, he's a young earth creationist. He's like 17 years old. Um, and he we basically explained to him what the general process of evolution is. Uh, he was totally fine with that. Then we explained more or less the phylogeny challenge to him, and he failed to answer it. We got him to we got him to accept that house cats are related to tigers and lions, which he did. Oh, that's a step. And then he then we tried to get him to accept that humans are related to chimps, and nope, that was a deal breaker. Yeah, well, that's kind of it. Yeah, they don't they, their little sliding scale slides uh, accordions in a hurry when it comes to that. Anyway. Um, in a Twitter every, exchange, hmm? I was just gonna say it seems like every animal can be related to other animals, except for when it comes to humans and apes. Yeah, that well, that's where the sliding scale comes in. Is that most baromenology and creationist systematics uh, uh, collapses into the family level, typically? So a family is a kind, which happens to be weird coincidence the traditional definition of kind back in the 18th century. Um, and so that was it. Well, the problem is, is human beings and Bonzo the chimp and all the rest are in the primate family. So if you go at the family level, you have got a lot of close relatives that they can't allow. Humans have to be specially created. The species is the kind for us and us alone. They're okay for at other levels, and sometimes it can wander all over the place, especially as we were pointing out in the new book that Jackson and I are doing about how um, people really should know better. We're With just dogs. bandying about birds as, as created kinds, and they don't really mean that because actually even the creationists think that there were at least like 180 or so uh, different bird kinds, uh, although they leave out most of the data to arrive at all of that. RJ, but they're in a... Have you have you uh, told him about the the Canis situation that White put himself in? Oh, oh, oh yeah. Well, well, the, um, the, the even something as obvious it, the creationist wants to bring up common things, and dogs are really obvious. And he doesn't seem to realize, Monty White, that dogs are pretty varied, and you've got uh, 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 all of existing domestic dogs are a single species. But you've got a whole bunch of other ones that are actually multiple species. And the moment you can get out of the dog canis bunch into the dog cousins and accept them, it just opens up a cascade that ain't going to really stop until you've gone all the way back to myocids. And pretty soon now you got the cats and dogs together uh, in the same thing. Uh, technically, if you, if you wanted to translate evolution into baromenology, you would say that evolution contends that all life on Earth is one hollow barrowman. And that's how it works out. So everything that we see as individual diversity is merely variation, monobaromanic lineages within the great big barrowman that includes everything on Earth. Um, what's going to be fun to see is how much of that thing actually gets accepted by anti-evolutionists, that the barrowmanologists keep shredding 
their argument and and they have to either bump into weird contradictions or they have to flush data down the drain so it, uh, the, the the major action to keep group a and group b from connecting up they got to eliminate most of the data field so they don't have to worry about it and they can see them as separate kinds white That's couldn't even do that right. with with and that i mean you know, white couldn't do that with his canis example which i thought was so funny because even by his own standard because all jackals are mm -hmm. supposed to be related to each other even though jackal is not one species and then they're all canis so yeah yeah it's, so that's so, uh, the, the systematic issue one of the if i live long enough uh help help uh, the old rj so i can live long enough uh one of the books that will be down the line that is a huge unfilled area is just how do anti-evolutionists approach systematics and taxonomy? Or rather, how do they not? And so that really is a discussion. You know, uh, Jackson had to leave because his, his uh, connection is so crappy that he was roboting and all the rest. Hopefully he'll be back anyway. Um, but that uh, systematic issue is a great big giant one. Anyway, Isaiah Booker um, uh, uh, tossed at, at a Twitter exchange that I was in, he tossed at us as evidence against evolution um, a video couple videos and one of these videos was one that I put a link to which was on flood geology and how these mega sequences these huge swaths of of deposits supposedly were put out in the flood in a you know a early flood and late flood so they're being that fussy about when this stuff is occurring and um, uh, there was there were no sources at all in the video itself just graphics and claims. And I think they referred to one paper, this Paulson paper, which is actually about the Idiacara period, which is completely, you know, it's, it's 600 million years ago. I mean, it, it's not even relating to uh, a lot of the areas that they were dealing with and doesn't support their argument either. Um, but the thing is, is that you end up with bold assertions in this video and no way to check them. So that's immediately a problem. I decided to check out some of the, the buzzwords that they were using in the video, and I quickly determined that basically they are channeling the argument of Tim Clary, who has done some stuff at Institute for Creation Research and also at Answers in Genesis, and I put a bunch of links up to his arguments. And one of the things that I was just studying today was um, a claim that he was making in uh, the one on dinosaurs being found uh, in the flood sequence where he uh, um, uh, cites um, uh, Jack uh, Horner's uh, 1988 book on digging dinosaurs where he discovered the Mayasaur eggs. And along the way, he describes this thing where over a thing of about a mile and a quarter by a quarter mile, there's a big deposit of some 10,000 Mayasaurs that died, or rather pieces of them. They're like 30 million fossil fragments. And supposedly this was all in one nice, neat, tidy little flood thing. Um, and I decided to look it up to find out what was going on. And fortunately, I was able to find the book in an online source so I could physically read through it. And it turned out that the details of the thing made sense if there had been like maybe a drought that had killed a lot of these ones. There might even have been volcanic gases from nearby volcanoes that were uh, uh, killing them off. But at any rate, they died. Some of the fossils, had, the bones had already started to fossilize. They had fallen apart to bits. And then at some stage, there were no scavengers around to deal with it. So there, there, probably some climatic thing had really bumped off a lot of them. And um, there was no water involved in this, no flood. And then um, probably a mudslide, probably something in a pyroclastic way from, again, a volcano, washes the now decayed bits and pieces into a big muck. And because of now it's a slurry, it's ending up pushing everything and aligning the bones in a particular direction. And then as it settles out, the ashes coming up to the top and the um, uh, other mudstone material is settling out at the bottom. So it makes perfect sense from a natural framework and not all at once because the animals are dead and some of them starting already to fossilize before you get this second stage popping in. And this happened about like 70 million, 75 million years ago uh, in there. And the thing is, is that none of that information is presented by the creationists. They just whoop, zip right past it.
Am I supposed to be impressed with that? So we got any comments over in the in the side chat here? Uh, boo -boo 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 -boo. Um, right now we're somebody talking Hamden Hamdi. Hmm. Uh, and he he is um, a um, anti evolutionist. Uh, I will say so. Um, he is also he he's a Muslim, and he. Uh -huh. And he is was questioning what your work is, and um, Brian had said that you were a uh, author and a science communicator, and we're now we're trying to see if he will go on, gonna go Ooh, for it, yes. his channel. He says he will not go on a live stream, and and that nope. is something that civilization may be very grateful to him for. I don't know. Uh, but uh, he referred to some nature article back there. What the hell was that referring yeah, to? He was talking about how he was um, go w how he was talking on um, Jackson's channel, and Jackson reportedly uh, blocked him or something because of the science article he referenced. Oh well, I don't do it. I don't block anybody for that. However, I do question whether or not we, we can ask him directly since he's in the feed there. Uh, Hamden, did you read the article that you cited or did you merely reference it and acquire that reference secondarily? That's a big difference. And that's a yes or a no. If you have quoted the material, you may have quoted extensively from it. But if you got that from a secondary source and did not fact check it, you did not read the article. And if you did read the article, then be honest and say so. So give us a yes or no, if possible. Uh, well, he's, Hamden quoted but, uh, verbatim. Yeah. Third way that. of evolution. Ooh, that's um, what third way of evolution? He's and saying that. Um, well, the thing is, he's saying that evolution evolutionists are going against the uh, mutation by natural selection, and huh. that they are saying that it is no that it's not science. When I actually read the article he's talking about, and no, they didn't say anything like that. What they're showing is that people in the science field do exactly what the fuck scientists do, and they question everything. These people, there's a group, a small, small group of people who um, are slowly gaining in numbers and thinking that natural selection may have not have been. The means of evolution but again this is because they do what scientists do and they well, question fact, it, here's something another surrogate here because it, it reminds me if it's involving like massimo piliucci and some of these others that are are talking about uh, uh their, their evo devo groups they're arguing that epigenetics and other factors are so much more dynamic than just the older richard dawkins model of neo-darwinism that it deserves a new name that's a, a part of the aspect and meanwhile your jerry coins will come over and say no it isn't it's just the same stuff but applied to some new layers of regulatory mechanisms and it's still nat natural selection uh mm -hmm. that uh, uh, stuff that benefits you and it's occurring naturally is going to uh, and it leads to differential survival that's natural selection so in some ways it's green eye shade fiddly bit um, uh, terminology and the use of very specific things. That's why I like to say evolution is natural branching common descent. Now I'm not determining whether or not natural selection or sexual selection or epigenetics or gen neutral drift are the are what role those play dynamically. It's that every single organism on earth shall have had a naturally branching common descent relationship with every other organism on earth. Now you don't have to be bogging down on, on which mechanism necessarily applies. But your anti-evolutionists, and particularly the, the, um, uh, the creationists, uh, Muslim creationists, tend to channel a lot of intelligent designy modes of things. Of course. Uh, they tend... Yeah, jump in. Well, the thing is, is uh, Brian uh, posted a website about the third way of evolution, and they're saying uh, they want to make alternate views available. But the one, um, the one uh, article that he was referencing, the Nature article, was an actual article about um, 
a small group of people who do believe evolution to be true. Mm. They are just questioning by the means of natural selection. And yeah, well, given the vast amount of, of data supporting natural selection, uh, it seems a tall order for them to quibble. So I'd oh, love to and it, oh, oh, Hamden asks me, so James, are you with the Jerry Coyne and Dawkins paradigm? First of all, could you describe uh, the the uh, Jerry Coyne Hawkins par Dawkins paradigm. I'm going to let's see which one of us gets there faster. Uh, Jerry Coyne is a standard uh, genetic style natural selection guy. He allows for developmental biology factors and all that. That's his field. He pays attention to all that. Richard Dawkins is a zoologist. His limitation had been that he came from an older school that tended to be a little too fussy about adaptation as a dynamic. And uh, if I would be described as anybody, I would say I'm more of a Stephen Jay Gould style, um, um, uh, not quite always adaptations, I, uh, except spandrels and a lot of these other things. If you look at the data floor, you find that an awful lot of the air quotes disputes that happen, happen over fiddly bit definitions of things. But they're not arguing that things aren't related by natural branching common descent. And that's why I like to use that as a definition of evolution rather than yeah. change of allele frequencies over time and or anything like that. And it's funny because he just put in the chat mutation, variation, natural selection. And Nepi Crows pointed out something that I guarantee you is the case. And he says, and he can't define any of those terms, I bet. Well, and, and I'll, I'll tell you explicitly. Uh, we observe natural mutations. There's a huge technical literature on it. We observe variations within populations. Populations are the dynamics of speciation. They are also the dynamics of evolution because individuals don't evolve, populations do. And mm -hmm. e even though individually, the population consists of individual organisms that have inherited each one of their mutation variation packages as an individual, you don't have individual genes surviving, you are in a package deal, uh, then all of that collective of population variation is what happens. Uh, that can uh, Theoretically, it can go along in the same mode uh, indefinitely, or it can develop mutations that under new circumstances, that's where the natural selection comes in, that no mm -hmm. mutation is, or very few mutations are in and of themselves beneficial or deleterious. It's only within context. Most mutations are neutral. And so whether or not a neutral mutation that knocks around and builds up like a storage battery in your population and then changing environment alters the circumstances and now what was a purely neutral variation now takes on positive adaptive or negative adaptive characteristics because your environmental conditions have changed. You've encountered a bacterium that's new, some predator or some a feature where it's not as advantageous to see in one spectrum of light versus another or it is advantageous. Suddenly something that didn't matter did. And that's, and just that's to make why this you have to clear, look at the details. And just mm -hmm. to make this clear, just because the majority of the mutations are neutral today does not mean we don't have beneficial mutations. No, because there are do. several that are currently in existence today that we know of. Like, for instance, you have the, um, the Apo AI uh, mutated gene in a small population in Italy called the Apo AIM. Which, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, the one that, uh, that uh, makes them more resistant to, uh, what, what is the, uh, oh, is it AIDS uh, or something? No, it makes them more re uh, resistance in uh, blood clots. Blood clots, yeah, that's it. And, and uh, oh, uh, uh, oh going to go for it is asking, uh, James, do you know of any Muslim populations evolving to the current standard of science? Actually, it's a broad mix. Um, you, if you're in Saudi Arabia, they're functionally creationist there. Uh, wacky flat earth creationist. I mean, woo, you read some of their textbooks, you're going, holy moly. Uh, but ironically, Iran, of all places, Iran has never altered their science curriculum. So they st still teach to this day in the land of the mullahs, full blown uh, evolutionary natural descent. <laughs> Isn't that weird? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it depends on the country. And it depends on the circumstance. Um, um, Islamic uh, anti-evolutionism is a recent phenomenon, and it's it, it's fed in various areas. You've got that Hiram, yeah, yeah, uh, in uh, Islamic creationism, uh, Muslim. Uh, it's basically feeding off of intelligent design tropes, and and quite a few 
Muslim creationist apologists, including ones that do stuff on YouTube that I've observed, basically channel that stuff. There's a certain amount of anthropic origin of the universe stuff in there. Uh, so they're more likely to be okay with the great age of the universe stuff. So they're, they're, they're not necessarily integrating much with the young earth creationists. Uh, it all depends. And of course, religious, uh, they can rationalize away just about anything. Uh, so Islam is not intrinsically anti-evolutionist any more than Christianity is, but branches of it can fold he's, into it. And you can find some Hindu anti-evolutionists. So it, it, it's Hamden just said that he's going to argue something with us. And I just, and just like Nepi Crow says, I, I really just can't wait for this. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, uh, I'm hopefully, I'm hoping redundant. to have a, a presupposition arm wrestling match with uh, Cy Ten Brendan Brooker or whatever his name is. Bergen Cape. Yeah, yeah. Um, he, um, that's about Gene. Uh, uh, oh, oh, Hamden, do you know Gene? Uh, let, let's ask Hamden this question basically Do you claim that any of the ALUs in your genome were deliberately designed or intended to be there? Yes or no? Try that one on for size. And I'll even type in ALUs. And it's not a minor detail because about 10% of the human genome is ALU. There's over a million of them and they're growing at like 200 every generation. So, um, uh, because it's got a copy me, copy me, copy me, copy me, copy me, copy me, uh, code to it. And, uh, so, so if you want to go ahead, let us know if you think any of the ALUs are designed or not. Gene redundancy is fatal to the evolutionary concept. Oh, that's not true, Hamden. I would like you to cite any, any technical literature by all means, uh, that would claim it did. In fact, gene redundancy is far, not only not fatal to it, it's very useful to it. It's the fact that you have multiple genes that can do varying things, and so each of them can go their own little separate ways. Uh, Hamden, uh, do you actually bother reading much of the primary source technical literature here? Uh, you haven't answered my question about that nature paper, whether or not you actually read the paper itself or merely uh, a description of it in some secondary source. He said that he actually read the paper. Ooh, goody gumdrops, and maybe he doesn't understand it. He probably doesn't, because like I said, the paper itself wasn't about, because I came across the exact same paper doing research of my own on um, evolution for a um, video I'm in the process of doing. And what it actually says is that there's a small group of people who um, are slowly growing in numbers that question natural selection. Yeah, I probably have the really thing said. in my bibliography because if it was in Nature, I, I check Nature each week, and so any coverage of that would be in there. If you can remember any of the guys' names, um, oh, or, or no, uh, I, I actually know. can probably try to look it up again, but it might have even it may have not even been Nature. It may have been in Scientific American because mm. well, that uh, would be a, that would be a, a more generic source than that. Although there are summary articles in Nature, but he explicitly says it's Nature. If if that's what we're talking about, uh, the um, uh, the reptile oh, mammal animal man a, animal man ask if he can get a wrench so he can put uh, something oh, in the oh, chat. Oh, absolutely. Let me give you a, a wrench here, Buckaroo. Uh, let me um, get my little screeny thing out of here, and I'm happy to do so if my little button will work. And add you as a moderator. Thou art wrenched, hopefully. You should be wrenched. I certainly tried to give you a wrench, and I thought I did. And yes, add moderator. We'll see. Should do it. Yeah. Okay, so he should be wrenched at this point. Anyway, um, the reptile mammal transition is, is useful because it looks as slow as molasses we can identify even a lot of the micro mutations that are involved in the pieces and bits of it in, uh, that we can see. Nothing in it uh, violates the natural variation stuff. We can track it in relation to our own developmental biology and genetics of living organisms. We can see the variations that we see between monotremes and uh, marsupials and, and placentals. And we've got predicted transitional forms of the yin-yang, including those little double-jawed probanagnathids. 
Uh, so uh, I don't think anything in gene redundancy is going to be a problem for that. And if you want to try to show that, by, by all means, you know, tackle the reptile mammal transition guy. Uh, Hamden, give that a whack. You'll be the first one to, tr to give it a go. And um, we're trying to answer, uh, uh, what is your question again? We're contending that your question, if you're saying gene redundancy, that it's not a problem for evolution. What makes you think it is? And so we're, we're, we're questioning the validity of your assumption and on what basis you drive sources on this uh, front. Um, it's kind of hard to do a hell of a lot of discussion in the side chat of the video. Uh, so by all means, if you have technical literature on this point, make a point after the video is done and post it up on YouTube, come in and comment and cite the source literature that you believe is so terribly important and relevant here. Uh, let's have at it. I'll be happy to do that uh, because first of all, I'll check to see if it's in my data field. And uh, if it's not, then I'll follow up on it as well. And I will say I'm not holding my breath that any of the stuff you're likely to cite is going to be what you think it is because I kind of keep really close track of all the technical literature here. And it all looks like natural branching common descent to me. I mean, it's, it's as natural as all get out. There doesn't seem to be any high, a sign of a designer knocking around in any of that. Uh, let's see. So, uh, um, oh, I, we, 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 um, I diverged about the fact that I was going to discuss those damn mega sequences. Um, I just started the, the analytical work on him. His main argument is that there's several different layers of um, uh, Clary's argument at Answers in Genesis. And then he's got one tech couple technical papers. Uh, I think he's done stuff in the new 2018 creation conference that they just had in Pittsburgh as well. I didn't put linkage up, up to that. But the um, uh, 2017 paper he did where he goes in about the sock deposit. Uh, in principle, we can look up all of those technical citations. And if anybody else wants to get their little bee in the bonnet that they know the geology. But it's the devil's in the details. And what is, Clary needs to have is not merely that animals died and that a geological environment stretches over a long period of time because there's like rock. It's that he has to argue that it really can form in unbelievably rapid time and that the details of what you're seeing of what's in specific chunks of that deposit across what appear to be a normal landscape doesn't mean a normal landscape after all. And so they can come up with cute little charts and graphs and color blobs and all that kind of stuff. But Okay, hey, uh, James. Yeah. He says, um, he says, okay, redundancy. Multiple gene coding for one characteristic. To evolve that characteristic, you need to mutate that group of genes with the same mutation. How can this happen? Uh, um, oh, oh, well, uh, well, he's going to have to give a damned example. Uh, many complex characters have lots of components to it. But that's the whole point, is that most complex features don't come about all at once. You don't have to have all the genes all do their thing instantly. All you need to show is that the stages to it are all natural. So he's got to give an example. Not, yeah. not, a, uh, not a generic. Well, um, I typed the, into Google his uh, scientist who question or who um so, like something along the lines of scientists who question uh natural selection or whatever and the closest thing i got was a list by third way evolution on um scientists who are wanting to take a second look into natural selection yeah there there are factors about um it all falls under the ballpark of an adaptationist paradigm is how much of what we see in evolution is directly adaptive in nature and how much of it is stuff that just does pretty well under the circumstances so that there's not a selection for a particular thing at many times. And there's still a legitimate debate on this because for one thing, we can only look at existing organisms in super detail. Everything in the past is a shadow play that's occurring in the fossil record with little snippets of information to go on. And so uh, a lot of the, the quibbling on that, and I have, have heard a third way, I'd have to have my bibliography up to be able to go hunt around for that keyword and that to uh, find some of the people that are involved in it. But uh, a lot of it's a tempest in a teapot in the same way that an awful lot of the debates between Richard Dawkins and um, 
uh, uh, Stephen Jay Gould back in the 1970s and 80s were like tempests in a teapot, and they became irrelevant as we moved into a new data field. Uh, that, that if you want to see the cutting edge bunch, they're the ones that deal with Evo Devo. Uh, they're oh, looking oh, oh. at the. Hey. He actually gave um, a thing. He says, because uh, Peter gonna go for it says that mm -hmm. most likely being pasting from a creationist website, probably even a Christian one. And he says, no, it's from an article from someone named Dr. Atham. Oh, I got, I'll, I'll, I'll write that down. And so, um, uh, the name does not immediately ring a bell, but that does not necessarily suggest a, a, a problem. And, uh, does he have a one, uh, by all means, again, um, Hamden, make a point of putting a direct link into whatever comment you put in once the show stops and the thing is posted as a regular video because I, I don't delete comments from that. Um, uh, beware that if you say stupid stuff, I'm going to comment on it as stupid stuff. But if you have some article from this on this argument, uh, and uh, there's another question that be prepared to answer the following question on this art article. It's if it maintains uh, an idiosyncratic claim, I'm assuming that if it's rigorous, it has offered sources for it. Did you check out the sources to see that the guy was playing fair with the facts? So that's another matter. And um, uh, Hamden says he is a creationist. Um, then that's an apologetic argument, and you jolly well better put him through a good ringer in terms of his source of help. Uh, um, we'll ask Hamden, does he have an opinion about the reptile mammal transition data or fossils in general? Or is it just all genetics? It, so far, he's just talking about genes. Yeah, see, there, um, we have such an interconnection now, and paleogenomics is busily retroengineering stuff. So more and more, uh, initially, they were just being able to look at uh, protein sequence uh, genes, but now they're starting to play around with cis regulatory uh, triggers and to figure out like they discovered the genes that flipped in to turn the dinosaur snout into the bird beak and they can flip them off and bingo, you got a bird with a dinosaur snout instead. And there's a developmental history behind all of that. Um, theoretically, okay, I pulled up the guy. I pulled up the guy mm -hmm. he mentioned. Um, okay. One, one of the the very first thing that he shows is a book he has um, written on Amazon that's called "Renounce Your Atheism." Ooh. The very next one is um, is the same thing, and then um, there's a Reddit post about infamous creationist paper by Islamic warrior Haytham Talat. And Hamden has immediately gone, but origins are bust. Um, uh, that, is there a paper on how life originated? Uh, there's a lot of things done on that subject. Let's put down, a, a, you be clear for us. Uh, Hamden, when did you think life originated? What did it consist of? And give us a short summary of what you think happened to it after that. How long does it take to get to people? Let's kind of put him on a time frame to get a sense about that. Allah did it. Uh, well, but you know that that that's not an explanation. That's a hope, uh, but it's the chronology. And and I contend in my tip work, and uh, I verify that anti-evolutionists have really vague map of time. And it doesn't matter whether they're old Earth creationists, young Earth creationists, or intelligent design. They they've got a vague notion of stuff, and they bandy terms around and have maybe a couple benchmark dates, but they haven't really thought through what the hell they think was going on. Least of all with the origin of life. So uh, um, give us a, a little bit of a, of, a, of a precious about what it is you think, because if you don't actually have a view upon the data field, then all you're doing is mouthing <laughs> objects of desire. I have came across something that he said. Uh, genetic redundancy enhances problems of beneficial dot, dot, dot. And this is by Juniper Publisher. It's mm. a PDF. La -da. Oh, official mutations. Haytham Talat, civil engineering. Ooh, yes, there, there is somebody outside of his field. Yes, he's already speaking about something that's outside of his field. 
And on yeah, bear in mind that I have tens of thousands of technical papers from the actual technical journals on an awful lot of subjects. So once I can find a thing, and if I read any of his material, I'll be looking at him from a source methods analysis and to see, and, and perhaps we will discuss that our next episode. Uh, that could be it. Uh, yeah, I can download uh, Nep the PDF. Uh, Nepic Cross is asking, you know, when I never heard from a creationist in all of my life, a uh, time alive, a single time, I just want them to say that they have an error bound for their predictions. Well, they don't really make predictions. There's the problem. There's an awful lot of non-application. The map of time thing is not a trivial detail. Anti-evolutionists don't really know what they think happened. They may have an object of desire. There wasn't evolution. No, can't be that Darwinism stuff. No, 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 no. There must have been something that was designed. And maybe it was recent in the case of young Earth creationists. It was you know, a few thousand years old. But they don't really stop to bother that if you got in the time machine and went back to such and so a date on 4,000 thing or whenever uh, Hamden thinks creation took place, what would he be seeing? And then what happened? And how much of it is, remember, we don't have to guess that a replicating system is subject to natural selection. It is. We don't have to guess at that. You can't avoid it. That's one of the little insights that, that Richard Dawkins keeps reminding people of, that, that a, a, a replicating system that has naturally inheritable mutations is Darwinian. It can't help it. That there, anything that's going to enhance its survivability and be passed on differentially to descendants, that's natural selection. Now, that is, in not, that is not in and of itself the generation of novel new forms and the reason why a wildebeest looks different from a rutabaga. Uh, but okay, that's, uh, there's hold more on. to it than that. So he's telling us to check out this paper by him. Um, Hamden, I'm sorry, but the very first issue we have is the fact that he's a civil engineer, which means he's already speaking outside of his field. Yeah, he's not a biologist and the like. Anybody can write. I mean, I'm not a paleontologist and all that, although I will tell you that actual paleontologists have vetted my work. I make a point of getting them to analyze the stuff to make sure that I'm accurate. And uh, Christine Janis, who is a prickly, hard to please paleontologist, loved slam dunk. So I'm not losing any sleep over that thing. I'm really uber careful. But anyway, uh, uh, believe me, I'll want to look up this guy and I will check what he has to say. And we'll find out whether or not he is impre as impressive at an objective source level as you seem to think he is. Um, like said, and we'll ask Hamden, does yeah. Hamden, did Hamden source check any of the assertions that this um, uh, um, a Talat guy says? That's another yes or no question. And so that one is, is a straightforward methods question. If you oh, didn't do that, then all you are doing is secondarily repeating somebody else. And that's a, a source methods failure. Um, the more um, out of mainstream somebody is, the more you have to fact check them to make sure that they're not pulling stuff out of the, uh, their, their hat. And the religious motivation or lack of it is completely irrelevant to how source analysis does. You can apply source analysis to full-blown atheist paper if you like, and I have done that. And uh, I'm perfectly happy to say, uh-oh, this guy hasn't actually made their argument very well, or they're missing a point here, or they need documentation at this point. And these are all objective systems questions. So um, uh, um, this is rather fun. Uh, and then, of course, the other killer question would be, is there any evidence that would persuade him that he's wrong? And does well, he... The thing he just said that um, according to his YouTube channel, he Ooh, is a, a um, he is a um, what you call it a uh, a physician, a doctor. yeah, a physician. But the thing is, is that's not according to this so-called paper that he did, and that he, according to him, he says that that's an error. Hmm. Well, so well, people self-identify in odd ways. I've seen um, uh, Michael Denton and Michael Behe being referred to as geneticists and uh, uh, microbiologists and others. No, none of them are that. They're biochemists. And there are very specific terminology fields that go into these areas. But again, it's a matter of looking at what the primary source arguments are and getting at some benchmarks. Um, you can make any argument that you like, but you gotta pay attention to all the data. So how do you account for ALUs? How do you account for the reptile mammal transition? Uh, what is your date for the origin of life? All of those are basic questions. 
Hamden also asked me um, if I can uh, send him sourced claiming that gene redundancy isn't fatal to evolution and beneficial mutations. Well, gee, we'd have to find out what the hell it means. So we need to find out what this gene redundancy thing is. I don't have my bibliography open, so I can't uh, hunt around on that. And, and so I'm kind of stuck on that feature. But um, uh, from what I understand in the gene duplication field, which is where gene redundancy would come into play, uh, that I would be really surprised to find any indication that it is considered a problem for evolution because otherwise it'd be showing up as a problem for evolution in standard science works and it isn't. So we'll have to find out whether your source means what you think it does, how well it is documented and what it connects up with in terms of primary source data field. And then we will ask the question again to you, Hamden, did you source check this work that you read to determine whether or not what was being said was true. How did you go about fact checking it? And the thing is, is, is it's funny because, um, shoot, I had something I was going to say and now it just completely slipped my mind. Oh yeah. The thing is, is Hamden, you have to realize that when it comes to science, if anything is going to throw the paradigm out of shift, it, um, it, will be brought forth because this is how you get money yeah you're you're you're, you're uh, dropping out a little bit of, I'll, I'll kind of fill in what i think the point you were making of is that uh if you if there's a standard paradigm boy your reputation can be made if you can knock it off its props i mean look at einstein and newton as an example of it but you gotta have a solid model to do it with, and you have to account for all the data your opponents can account for. And that's one of the things that anti-evolutionists fail miserably at. They just bypass too much of the data field on that. Um, so um, yes, uh, we know your source is Hytham's paper, Hamden. The question is, did you fact check the paper? That's a different question. Otherwise, it's just a paper. People say all sorts of things. There are people who think the earth is flat. There are people who write papers that are certain that it's uh, the center of the universe. There are people that write stuff that are they're sure that AIDS isn't caused uh, or, uh, by uh, uh, um, the virus. Uh, there are some people that are sure that vaccines don't work. There are some people that are sure that uh, uh, everybody but Lee Harvey Oswald killed Kennedy. There are people who are certain that there was a conspiracy at 9-11. There's people who write all sorts of stuff. All yeah, of sorry, that I was breaking up. I was breaking up for a second. Um, but what breaking I was saying was... It's not hard to do online. <laughs> You're right. Um, but what I was saying was that if there is something that's going to question the paradigm in science. The person who brings that forth will be will be known throughout science as the man who figured out something that everyone else did not know. Oh because yeah, and you 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 have constantly in in science we they are always constantly questioning each other. And they sit there, and once they find that something oh, is wrong... Oh, i got to jump in here. Hamden has just dived off the gangplank. Don't treat Hytham's paper as a primary source. That's the whole point, is that it's not a primary source. And you have apparently just conceded it is not a primary source. It is a secondary redaction. So I ask you again, did you fact check the claims being made in it against primary sources or seek out primary sources to evaluate it. Either you did or you didn't. Let's get a yes or no on that. And everybody watch to make sure whether or not he comes up on that. I, I, I feel like we're going to have jello nailing to the wall process here on this, that we're never really going to get a yes or a no on that because very few people want to consciously admit that they don't actually fact check anything. It sounds bad because it is bad. And so they go into deer in the headlight mode on that front and try to switch to another subject matter. But the problem is, is that everybody, here's my general downwards tip lesson, is that everybody who believes something that's really not true can only have done so by those bad methods approaches. Now, people who believe things that are true can do those bad methods too. You, uh, there's, there's no guarantee that a sloppy method can't accidentally arrive at a, 
at an accurate position that happens to be true. But the problem is, is you don't believe it because it's true. It's because you blundered into it. You don't really have a rigorous argument. But anybody that believes things that are definitely not true, they've got to use those things. And there are addiction to secondary sources, not fact checking them, the limited data field that your primary uh, arguments, uh, fact claimants base on, uh, inability to work out what you think happened, the map of time, and never saying what would change your mind. And it sounds like we're bumping into several of those with Hamden. So by all means, I said, I urge you, and we'll, I'll be trying to hunt up the thing myself later on, um, uh, the, the paper. And uh, did, do you have that in a, uh, 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 did you put a link to that in the uh, public chat or something on that, that paper from Hamden, uh, from Haytham? Um, no, I don't have the link uh, because there's a PDF that automatically downloaded to my phone. Oh, oh, one of those sneaky little things. I'll, I'll search around for him and find out what he has to say on anything. Uh, he may already be uh, in my bibliography. I don't know. The name does not ring I a can, bell, but I have a small I number. Actually, I can actually get the um, website I got it from and link it in the chat. Uh, yeah, they, I'll, I'll give a, uh, I'll give a, uh, a wrench to uh, Nefecross here, too. He wants to post a, uh, a link to that, and we'll see what's going on on it. Um, a lot of a lot of stuff is used see here. buzzwords that uh, a gene redundancy doesn't mean in and of itself anything until you see how it's applied. Redundant regarding which gene, redundant redundant in what instance, redundant with what suite of population, and that. So you'd have to look in specific examples. I would be surprised, given my familiarity with the genetic literature, that I kind of keep a finger on for tip. I would be surprised if there's anything that is meaning what he thinks it does. But we'll find out. Uh, oh, that's a YouTube. I was hoping there would be a, uh, um, a technical paper on that one. Yeah, the link that I provided was the same website that um, I got the PDF file from. And mm -hmm. it is definitely, pro uh, I haven't read through it yet because um, I didn't have the time to. But, um, oh, he said his link doesn't work. Um, well, I, so, so, uh, so long as the spelling is correct, H-A-I-T-H-A-M-T-A-L-A-A-T, -A -A I'll do a little yes. search and find out what the circumstances are from what he has to say. There's a small branch of kind of sciencey Muslim apologists. Uh, some of them are okay with evolution in one layer or another. Others channel aspects of anti-evolutionism. Some of it, again, veers over into intelligent design arguments and all that. And uh, this gene redundancy one is one that hasn't rung a bell with me, which means it's kind of a, an odd little minor niche thing. And that's often because the reason why it's a minor niche thing is because it's a bad argument and nobody else copies it. So that, that could be an interesting little tidbit as to why it's popping up the way it is. Because if it's, if it's that much of a killer problem, how come answers in Genesis and Evolution News aren't bringing it up? <laughs> so we're uh, actually about a quarter past the hour. Uh, and uh, I think we probably exhausted all of our little fun and games on there. We have um, uh, Hamden Hamdi, who needs to... Um, fill us in with more of the information of what he claims to be such an impressive thing. And uh, we will be looking for that. And I think we'll probably, this will be the topic that I will be adding in because if I'm going to look up stuff that I didn't know before, I might as well discuss it next week, assuming I'm still around. Hold on. Uh, what is it mean by Atham is the one who invented it? Uh, oh, well, boy, this might be another Edgar, Mr. Intelligent Design. Uh, in the same way that that genetic entropy of John Sanford or others, that, that, that may be a bell and whistle. Oh, the, the physician civil engineer who has come up with the important scientific discovery that the rest of everybody else doesn't pay attention to. Uh, no, we'll see what he, he does. for it. It, It'll stand yeah. out like a sore thumb how uh, relevant it is depending upon what sources he relies on. Because yeah, there would be, and how he clearly he defines what the hell he means. Because there's just a huge amount of technical literature on gene duplications, and if if gene duplications were somehow or other acting as a break on evolution, all of these zillion of people doing science work in this area would have spotted it by now. But yeah, no, no, no. So I'm I methinks 
Hamden, that you may be on a very shaky limb and you're sawing it off and you're on the wrong side of it. But we'll find that out in, in future. And as I said, uh, once uh, we uh, close the video down, by all means, put your links up to what you think is important, but be prepared to ask, to answer how you fact check them. So far, it doesn't sound like... Um, hey, uh, he wants to know how he can contact you to know your comments on the paper. You, but, it, the video, This once this video is posted, everybody who watches it can post a comment on it. Duh. Well, not only that, but um, I will definitely come back next week because yeah. he's already said that we're going to tackle that next week. So, yeah, I, I think, um, like I said, I'm going to look up what this is. And, and if I'm going to be looking at this material, I'm going to find out what it all it is. Uh, oh, Lord, Lord Quackers Quackers Quarrel, Quackers I didn't get around to it because I, by the time I got started, I didn't send you a link. Uh, there's a whole bunch of people I didn't send links to because I had to shut down Twitter uh, to get the show going. And, um, um, and such was life. So um, um, we, we missed the show here. But fortunately, we had somebody who's all, uh, gone into a lot of stuff on, on the uh, human evolution side anyway. And um, uh, we just had to skip on that. So uh, there is uh, this terrible uh, stuff of life. Um, oh, uh, the way to get a spreadsheet copy of the TIFF PDFs you posted on your site. Uh, well, not a spreadsheet copy, but all the PDFs are there for download. Anybody that wants stuff from the, that's what they're for. Download them, load them up. And the best way to read, I was writing in the old era of footnotes and the best way to do it, to read those is to make a copy of the text so that you can open the copy and open it to the footnotes. So that as you read the main text, you can see where the footnote is and you don't have to click one back and forth one to another. Uh, you can flip in and out inside of a Word document easily, but a fixed PDF is awkward to deal with. You have to scan down and back and down and back and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. uh, the newer been... material that I do, I don't use footnoting. I use direct referencing. Yeah, Hamden, um, you, you'll definitely hear about this uh, because like I said, Next week, the exact same day at the exact same time, Wednesday at 7, uh, I will definitely be back on because I'm going to read through this PDF uh, of Haytham's and look it in detail at it and find the sources he is using. And yeah. I, will, um, I will definitely be on next week as well to go It'll over It'll be a this. useful little uh, source methods analysis issue. Because uh, literally, there's only one technique you use at all times. It applies to all circumstances, all documents. You can analyze anything in politics, in science, in culture, in art history, in, his in doorknobs. It doesn't matter. Uh, everything can be analyzed through source methods, which is what information is there, how much of it is being presented, what hypotheses are you presenting, are they at variance with current views, if so, what. Uh, be careful with your terminology, define what you mean, work out what sufficient evidence is to establish your case, see if you can find that evidence, be aware of problems with your argument. It's the basic method. Duh. Exactly. And I, we will both be on uh, this channel, by the way, um, Hamden, because he asked me that. Yeah, uh, yeah that's the same one that I've been doing. doing. Yeah. Uh, if he's aware of my website uh, um, on the uh, thing, uh, uh, you'll find the links to my my chap the thing at my website if you don't have that one uh, people can comment there as well good heavens that's what i know i, I don't bite yeah. at least not not in the usual way but i do not suffer idiots likely and people who have bad method i'm sorry i'm gonna say so and um you know it, you, you can't fiddle part of round about it uh but this um this genetic redundancy issue sounds like Something that's gotten fuss potty and rearranged. So anyway, uh, there it is, another show down the tubes. And we've got um, uh, a new side issue for next week. Uh, remember source methods. Um, if you approve of the old RJ, tell people about the work. Let everybody know about it and, and apply the methods. Uh, learn the techniques. Uh, I, uh, anybody that follows me on Twitter should know by now, source methods questions are really tough for wooists to get past. They just clam up. They can handle insult easy, 
But a source methods question of, oh, that's an interesting thing. Where did you get that from? How did you fact check it? You start hearing cricket sounds. Uh, so Animal says the original paper seems to have been deleted and frustrated atheist. I found a post linking to the original paper and here it is. May uh, he be disappointed. So uh, Omni, let's look at this. Let me click that myself. So we're about ready to shut down and move them, hit them up, move them out rawhide. So thank you for uh, being on the program, uh, Frustrated. Hope this wasn't too frustrating oh, for you. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. This was this was just the proper amount of frustration. And one of the things that I liked about the uh, link that he just, that uh, Animalman just sent was the fact that it's open source. Gotta mm -hmm. love open access stuff because that just makes things so much easier. Yeah, um, there are there are ways around um, stuff that have firewalls and there are tricks of the trade. Uh, but I found that on technical articles, at least, even if the thing is not openly accessible at the website, there's often ways to find the paper otherwise. And as an impoverished scholar who can't afford ink and needs more people to help at my GoFundMe, hint, hint, um, that... Um, that matters because this critical element of source methods and anybody who ends up getting slam dunk will see this and anybody who's read the stuff I've already got up will see that I'm in embryo doing that source methods analysis is that if you want to see where a bad method screws up, it's at the source level. What do they pay attention to? What do they avoid? How do they treat sources? Are they fairly representing their source material? Have they thought through what their position is? Those are fundamental analytical things independent of the ultimate validity of the element uh, that they're they're defending. It's the method they use to arrive at it. And to paraphrase the thing, there is a madness to their methods. Bad methods oh, yields bad man, results. I just tried using that link. It just told me that it, uh, the page I was looking page for. Page not did. found. Yeah. So I'll have to hunt around on my own for it and, and see what the hell we got going. And uh, we are now um, saying about ready to shut down and stop the broadcast. Thank you so much. And we've gone past almost uh, um, a bit. Um, oh, and Sirius is saying the next Thursday work for our stream. I think Flat Earth would be the most fun, useful for our purpose.